Bonjour à tous. Je veux commencer par remercier les organisateurs du conférence et aussi dire que je vais donner ma présentation en anglais, mais je peux prendre les questions en français et même essayer à répondre dans la même langue. Je ne fais pas des promesses. Uh, okay, so I'm here today to speak to you about a project called The Scene Unseen, which is a legal, visual, historical, and also somewhat philosophical inquiry into the afterlives of former black site prisons, the first part of which was produced in Afghanistan in 2015. The Scene Unseen was made as part of my collaboration with Chitra Ganesh, uh, ongoing since 2004, as Marie just uh, mentioned to you. Uh, on the Experimental Archive Index of the Disappeared, which is an inquiry into the human costs of post-9-11 policies, both at home and abroad. One of our major projects has been looking at how the erasure, censorship, and redaction of data conceals and enables real disappearances in real lives, detentions, deportations, and, re and renditions. Another of our major projects has been archiving around the absences in official records patiently outlining the gaps until we build up a picture of what's not there. For the first few years of the index, we were working from directly within immigrant rights activist movements in the US. But as the archive expanded to cover the broader scope and deeper structures of the massive carceral regime of the so-called global war on terror, we began working primarily through and with documents like the ones you see here. From declassified government records to often contradictory first-person testimony from witnesses, prisoners, and their families, collected by NGOs, lawyers, and journalists. In 2015, just before we began a residency at the Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School, we decided to shift our tactics again to make our own images and conduct our own interviews about former black sites. The term black site is currently understood to refer to a secret prison operated by the CIA as part of their extrajudicial rendition, interrogation, and torture program, active between 2001 and 2009. However, any place that has been temporarily made invisible by a tacit or explicit agreement to not see something that clearly exists can also be understood as a black site, including temporary holding zones used for extrajudicial interrogation, from home and square in Chicago to the forward operating bases deployed by the US military. In Afghanistan, for example, shipping containers were used to transport, contain, and enact violence upon prisoners in transit. Interviews describe soldiers jumping up and down on top of shipping containers with men locked inside them in order to intimidate the captives and prevent them from sleeping. Here you see an aerial view of a lone shipping container spotted in an inlet off the road that stretches between the salt pit and Bagram, juxtaposed with redaction patterns from military police Q&As from the internal US Army investigation into the deaths of two prisoners, Habibullah and Dilawar, at Bagram in 2002. So the redaction in, this, in these documents is almost entirely concerned with removing names from the record, which explains the repeating smaller shapes. And to explain a bit more about why this image is being redacted, I'm gonna show you part of the film that we made as part of this project, which is also called The Scene Unseen. In this country, we know the following things to be true. Money changed hands. It paid for silence, a silence that swallowed people, places, and events. The people disappeared. Some of them came back eventually, or turned up in other places, far from their points of origin. Some of them told their stories, and some never spoke again. Others never came back at all. The places became invisible. There was no magic to it. The invisibility was an unspoken contract, into which we all entered more or less willingly an agreement to look away from the places we were not allowed to see, places exempt from the regime of surveillance that otherwise held sway, places where cameras could not go. Even the satellites showed them only as digital glitches or outdated static imagery. They were given the name of black sites because they were funded from black budgets, which is to say budgets that operate like dark pools, bottomless and opaque. They are still known by that name because they remain opaque, even once they become visible again, even after we decide that we will no longer look away. The events that happened within the bounds of those invisible places likewise took on a tinge of unreality, not because we disbelieved their existence, but because we could not locate the proof. We feared what would happen, we could imagine what must be happening, and eventually we knew what had been happening, the dark deeds that breed in hidden spaces. But the official line remained that none of it had ever taken place. 
and who among us could say otherwise? There were witnesses. They testified. The testimony was published. The books were translated. Official documents were released, much redacted. But when they were pieced together, we understood which shapes would fill the gaps. Everyone who cares to knows what happened, and where, and when. We can glimpse the contours of how, and guess at why, but nothing changes. Here is a city on a fault line, sundered by sites that were once rendered invisible. When you look at this city, the landscape begins to be overwhelmed by the twin weights of what you know and don't know, what you see and can't see, what Rumsfeld once so usefully called the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. The landscape begins to shiver and shake, the visible almost but not quite cracking to reveal the invisible pushing out its seams. The landscape begins to accumulate annotations, speculations, redactions. Every house might be that house, the blandly familiar villa with the mirrored glass windows and the private prison in the basement. Every shipping container stranded far from the industrial zone might be a Sub Rosa prisoner transport. Every triple fence and guarded, but apparently empty compound might be the former black site known by its inhabitants as the pit. And any of them, if not part of an old silence, might yet be swallowed by a new one. When you photograph a black site, you are left with an image that says almost nothing about what you cannot see. But the thing left unseen is the point of the photograph. So we are put in the paradoxical position of redacting our own images, chipping away at the scene, until we are satisfied that the image reflects both what can be seen and what resists being seen. How do you keep an open secret? Tie a knot in a dead man's tongue. If people keep asking anyway, run them in circles until they go away. We ask, of course, for permission to see the site of the former black site of Bagram. At first we are told yes, but we have to wait. We are given tea and a tour of the other prison. Then we are told that we can see where it used to be, but it has been demolished. Again, we have to wait for confirmation. We are given more tea. Then we are told that we can't see where it used to be, because it was never there to begin with, because the only prison at Bagram is the one we have already seen. Also, have we had enough tea? Because it is time for us to leave. We say, well, thank you very much, but that would have been more convincing in reverse. The story is repeated until it becomes a joke. It acquires the rhythms of comedy and pauses for laughter at appropriate intervals. There are two meanings to the phrase black humor. The first has to do with this kind of laughter, which is the laughter of someone faced with an abyss, a laughter whose echoes sound like something else. The second has to do with this kind of story, which is funny on the surface, but when cut down to blood and bones, is not really funny at all. Another meaning oozes out of it, thick and bitter and pitch dark. As if the coffee that you ordered was such, medium sweet, turned to dregs upon your tongue. But doesn't every coffee turn from sweet to bitter if you drink it past the point when you should have stopped and inverted the cup to read your fortune in the grounds? We had no coffee grounds that day, only those endless cups of green tea. The cups proffered no tea leaves for prognostication. The china, like the wall, was blank. The word prison, of course, has a very specific meaning. You might not think so, but then you don't live in our country. In our country, you have only been in prison if you have been imprisoned for more than 12 weeks. Otherwise, you have only been in a temporary holding facility, and never even really in the custody of another country at all. It does not matter that it takes far less than 12 weeks to break a human being into bits, when no one knows where you are or why you are there, not even, or especially, you. We spoke to a man who had been held in the place we had been trying to see, known to its former inhabitants as the darkness. He knew at least why he had been taken. He had been expecting it. He had something to bargain with in his interrogations. He spoke enough English to know when he was being mistranslated. He came out sane because he understood what was happening. Most of his neighbors were not so lucky. Sometimes he heard them screaming. The most common after effects of extrajudicial imprisonment are joint pain, back pain, kidney problems, headaches, memory gaps, and sleep disorders. Even a scrap of imagination can supply the causes. Doctors were on call in all these places, but they were there to certify that interrogation could continue. And when it had to stop, they were charged with returning prisoners to the condition that would enable interrogation to begin again. 
Neither doctors nor interrogators bothered to hide their faces, but interpreters were kept behind a curtain, both to shield their identities and to protect them from full knowledge of the methods being used. The interpreters were told that if they did see anything, they should leave it where they saw it. If an interpreter spoke up, he would disappear. If an interpreter quit, his ID card would be confiscated, making it impossible for him to travel. As soon as you enter prison, the things you wear and carry, which belong to yourself outside the prison, are taken from you, tagged with your prisoner number, and stored until you are released. In Bagram, they call this the PUC number, for person under control. When you enter a black site, a temporary holding facility, you still go through the ritual of stripping, shaving, examination, and uniform, but your belongings stay with you, because you have no PUC number, and if you are released, there will be no record of your imprisonment. If you die while you are in the black, you will be buried there, but no one who loves you will know where. Everyone who even resembles you will have been evacuated from the facility, and when they return, your body will be gone, and the ground behind the building will be disturbed, but pallets of supplies will also have been moved, so that no one can ever be sure. Ah, this cut off a little bit early. No one will ever have been sure exactly what has happened or exactly where. Um, so let me explain a little bit about the process behind uh, the film and behind our redaction of these photographs that we shot in Afghanistan, which became animated GIFs, which became part of the film. So basically we extracted redaction patterns and sometimes other graphic elements from documents in our Index of the Disappeared Archive that were relevant to the places that we photographed. Uh, for example, this is an aerial view of an area off the road to Bagram, just before the plane that lies before the airbase in prison, juxtaposed with redactions from sections of the 2014 Senate Select Committee on Intelligence uh, report <coughs> that's known as the Torture Report, um, referring to CIA detention operations in Afghanistan. And uh, also there's a diagram of the Tor Jail, the Prison of Darkness, taken from an Amnesty International report which is based on testimony of former prisoners. Um, the exact location of the Tor Jail is still unknown, and the building itself has reportedly been demolished, as you heard in the film, but most agree that it was just outside Bagram. Uh, and uh, an interesting note is that um, this diagram was reconstructed from the memories of former prisoners, basically um, as they called out to each other from their cells to, to kind of construct an, an audio like through sound, they constructed um, a, a visual uh, diagram of the film, basically by calling out to each other to understand how many um, how many cells there were and how many people were being held in them. And then they memorized each other's phone numbers so they could call each other when they got out, um, because they were being kept in darkness the entire time that they were there and the facility was underground. Um, Another thing we were looking at with this series was the sort of different visual regimes of redaction that are represented in the archive. So newly declassified documents are more likely to be redacted in white than black, as the government now believes that it is more difficult to extract the redacted information from the document using predictive algorithms um, when redactions are white on white. So this is kind of one of the the frontiers of the, the fight between redaction and unredaction um, is actually it's all being done with predictive algorithms now. Uh, meanwhile, the former site of the secret prison known as the Salt Pit, uh, which was uh, sort of famously uh, photographed with a very, very long telephoto lens by Trevor Paglin uh, years ago, um, is uh, located in an industrial zone off the road between Kabul and Bagram, and it's actually still surrounded by triple layered barbed wire fences and manned guard posts, although all the buildings that used to stand there have either been removed or moved underground. So, you know, the effort expended to guard land that appears empty, apart from a possibly artificial hill topped off with a few antennae, which granted does raise some other suspicions, uh, actually led me to wonder whether the U.S. Army might believe in psychogeography. Um, whether, you know, the traces of either evidence or experience had been embedded in the place in a way impossible to remove. Um, and I do think every country has places like this. Uh, in Iraq, it was Abu Ghraib, uh, where atrocities recurred no matter who ran the prison. Um, in Afghanistan, we have the Pulishaki prison, where there's a new block funded by the US, which was actually constructed just after the excavation of communist-era mass graves in the courtyard. Um, 
you know, there are some places that just have this kind of physical memory of, of, of certain acts embedded into them, and I don't know why we don't leave them alone. <laughs> like, um, uh, the redaction layers on this image were extracted from the 2004 CIA Inspector General report, which was released in 2009, uh, including sections related to waterboarding and to the death of Gul Rahman at the salt pit after um, a declination was faxed from headquarters permitting the use of cold temperatures in his enhanced interrogation. Um, the CIA Inspector General report was notably released with many pages entirely redacted with kind of occasional words or sentences surfacing from blocks of blackout. And um, that's why you see this, this image being so intensely redacted. Um, so the reason that we undertook this redaction of our own images has to do with this dual experience we had in Afghanistan, some of which is encapsulated in the film. And the first part of this was being just as frustrated by the physical sites as we had been by the redacted documents about them finding the real places just as opaque and withheld from us, because in most cases they had not yet been released from the official regime of secrecy, even though they were effectively open secrets. And the second part of it was that we found that the images we were able to produce in and from those sites were also frustrating us because they seemed unfaithful, not to what we had seen with our eyes while we were there, but to what we knew from our years of research to be true about places that appear to our eyes and camera to be empty or bland or unassuming, but had very different histories. So uh, this is a telephoto photograph of the Hotel Ariana, which is the unofficially acknowledged CIA base station in Afghanistan, and which was likely used as a temporary detention site for prisoners later dispersed to the Black Site Network between 2002 and 2005. And the redaction patterns superimposed on the image here were taken from the same SSCI torture report released in 2014, specifically from page 169 in the surrounding pages, which allude to the boxes of money which were presented to local government officials and considered as subsidy payments, intended in part as compensation for support of the CIA detention program. So this is a more official variant of the contract to look away from things we did not want to see. Um, the Dilkasha Palace inside the Arg Presidential Complex is one of the only places in Kabul that has a clear sight line to the Ariana. That's where I photographed this from. Um, so it may be inferred that they delivered the payment directly to their neighbor at the Arg. Um, the redaction in this particular report, uh, apart from the code names given to countries and detention sites, is really unusually concentrated in the footnotes, um, which is what gives rise to some of the odder shapes of redaction that we see here. So we felt that redacting the images actually made them more accurate by depicting not only the visible topography of these spaces, but their invisible topography as well. The ways in which they had been produced by particular regimes of secrecy, incarceration, and torture. And the ways in which they continued to reproduce various forms of those regimes, even after the originating structures were removed. Uh, here we have a photograph of an Afghan soldier on guard at the Parwan detention facility at Bagram Air Base. The prison, which is only a small part of the larger base, was transferred from American to Afghan control in 2013, and the rest of the base remains under American control. And the redactions here were taken from uh, SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures, and correspondence for the detention facility while it was also still under American control, um, as obtained by the American Civil Liberties Union through a Freedom of Information Act request. And each of these redactions cites a paragraph and section of uh, the Freedom of Information Act, giving the legal rationale for the removal of that information. So this is yet another kind of redaction. And it's important to note that spaces like black sites can only be constructed within and around places like Bagram, which are zones of exception constituted through compromised sovereignty. In 2001, the Afghan government ceded exclusive use, exclusive control, and peaceable, undisturbed, and uninterrupted possession of all facilities and land at the Bagram airfield to the US government, unless and until the US decides unilaterally that it no longer wants it. While prisoners were held by the US at Bagram, this lease meant that those prisoners had no access to Afghan courts or protections under Afghan law. And now that the US is using Bagram as a base for drone flights, it is equally exempt from Afghan government control or retaliation for drone strikes and for um, things like the Gorgon Stair blimp that you see there, which is used for um, wide area persistent surveillance, uh, no matter who or what they target. 
But this compromising of sovereignty, particularly when it concerns the compacts around monopolies on the means of violence, has insidious effects. So here you see an aerial view of the Carte Parwan district of Kabul, which has historically housed a large Sikh community and more recently been associated with privately operated prisons run out of residential villas. So the first such prison known to operate in Karte Parwan, holding eight Afghan nationals, was found in the basement of a house commonly believed to be a CIA safe house. Uh, but the American who ran it was disowned as a mercenary and handed over to the Afghan government for prosecution. This is actually one of the only times this has ever happened. Um, and the text superimposed on the image, which includes the phrase, Afghanistan is not a place for such activities, is taken from a BBC Persian article reporting the discovery, existence, and few known details about this prison. Uh, and this is the only such article currently available. This story was never, as far as we know, reported in any English language media, but within a few years, both mercenaries and warlords had taken up the practice of installing prisons in their residence basements, sometimes for kidnap for ransom schemes, sometimes for bounty hunting, and everyone was so busy not noticing what was happening next door, how could they spare any attention for what happened on the fringes of the city or out on the plains? So I'm going to wrap up by showing you how the scene on scene looked during its premiere at last year's DACA Art Summit as part of the show Mining Warm Data. Uh, the eight prints were installed in light boxes, sometimes with the redaction actually printed on a separate layer of Jirotrans. And in the same room was the video projection and overpainted neon sign, which combined a description of waterboarding actually by the person doing the waterboarding with a Bangla idiom to cover up a fish with greens. Um, that means trying to keep a secret everybody already knows. And we also showed a series of watercolor portraits of people who were caught up in the rendition system. So these are usually done from <coughs> images provided by them or their families to their lawyers for advocacy campaigns. Um, and in general, this is one of the few ways that we show recognizable images of people within the index archive, another being images of protest and dissent as we actually don't archive photographs of violence perpetuated on brown and black bodies. So I'll just leave you with the closing kind of seconds of the film which refer back to the um, torture report that I discussed earlier. The report gave color codes to each of the black sites used by the CIA in each country. The CIA black sites were not, obviously, the only black sites operating in our country or in any of these countries but they were the only ones covered by this particular report. The colors chosen by the authors of the report for the sites in Afghanistan, which were not the same colors used by the agency when the program was still operating, were cobalt, orange, brown, and gray. Perhaps it is no coincidence that these are all the livid colors of a bruise. Perhaps when that bruise finally fades, we will know what sort of scar these sites have left on the landscape. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.